Yeah, and so this led them to start um, start developing a Christian political theory. Right. Where as they lived out this creed that Jesus is Lord, they started to ask, well, then uh, what areas of life uh, does, well, if, if Christ is Lord over all of life, uh, what are the proper uh, earthly authorities in the different areas of life? And this led to something called sphere sovereignty. Uh, can you explain sphere sovereignty? Right. Well, let, let's start with the early church. You know, one thing that most people don't understand is that Christianity existed for 300 years as a persecuted minority religion in the Roman Empire. What that means, that's longer than the United States has been in existence. What that means then is that the church, by definition, is separate from the state. The church does, the state does not have authority over the church. If it did, it would have, it would have disappeared during the persecutions. Mm. So what this does is it says that there is something that is not under Caesar's authority. But where there is one something that is not under Caesar's authority, it creates the possibility that there are other somethings that are not under Caesar's authority. And what's going to develop over time is this idea of sphere of sovereignty, where uh, this is ar as articulated by Abraham Kuyper. Uh, he's going to argue that there are areas that are, in fact, autonomous, that, that by God's structuring of the world and of human life. These are things that have their own integrity and their own autonomy and get to govern their own affairs. Mm -hmm. So things like family, things like education, things like labor and, and business. Um, Kuiper would add science. Um, all of these kinds of things are there and they should be allowed to operate on their own terms without the government telling them what to do or how to do it. Now, interestingly enough, I didn't go into this in the book, but if you actually look at Genesis, at the things that and the implications of what God does with Adam and Eve prior to the fall, many of these ideas show up there. Hmm. And as a result, we can argue, and this is one of the things that you, you see through the Christian tradition when it comes particular to, particularly to issues of rights, there are certain things that are pre-political, that is to say, that existed prior to the establishment of human government and human law. Therefore, they are not under the authority of those things because they predated them. Hmm. You know, you can't say the government has, has authority over something that existed before the government itself existed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and if you'd like, I can parse out what those are from Genesis, but um, a, lot of, a lot of it really revolves around a careful reading and thinking through the implications of what God told Adam and Eve in the garden. Interesting. Yeah, well, you know, we can definitely go into a few of those, uh, because I think that if Christians, if we're going to live by a limited government view, well, then we should know where this view comes from in Scripture. So all the Scripture that we can dive into, the better. Okay, well, let's look at Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1, um, we see God creates humanity, and I'll use the word humanity here rather than man for a reason which will be obvious in a minute. He creates humanity in his image. Um, and it, it says literally, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so what we have here, and well, we have two different things that come out here. One of them is, what does the image of God mean? In the ancient Near East, if you claim to be the image of a god, what it meant is that that god has designated you as his representative, his regent, his face in the world. And this gave you divine authority to rule. That's the usage in, in the ancient Near East. And we mm -hmm. see that in Genesis, because... The image of God is immediately linked to take dominion over the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the trajectory in Genesis, in Genesis 1, you see the world is formless and void. God then spends the first three days forming the world and the next three days filling the world. Then he tells Adam and Eve, he, the people made in his image, to have dominion over the world to reproduce and multiply and subdue the earth. 
So they're to fill it and form it. Mm -hmm. They're to continue the work that God began in creation. This is what's known as the cultural mandate. Mm -hmm. This involves both male and female because, well, part of it is reproduce, right? Yeah. And, uh, but the other part is to uh, uh, subdue the earth, take, take dominion over the world. When you get to Genesis 2, this is uh, spelled out a little more precisely. First of all, God, well, God creates the garden. And in the garden, what you see is, um, first of all, the garden is described as having trees that are a delight to the eyes. So it is a place of beauty. And also that produce fruit that people can eat. So it is also a place of, of resources. And in fact, the entire description of where the Garden of Eden is, it's just laden with resources. The whole thing talks about the mineral resources, the water resources, the trees with the fruit, all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Adam is told to tend and protect the garden. Tending the garden then must mean at least two things. First of all, tending to the beauty of the garden, which is a mandate to produce art. And secondly, it's economic production. It's doing the things you need to produce your food. Um, and as we'll see later in history, this provides the basis for property rights. Adam literally had the right to the fruit of his labor. In this case, literally fruit. Then, so you're supposed to tend and protect the garden, tend it develop it appropriately, protect it, don't exploit it, don't destroy it. Then Adam tell, or God tells Adam to name the animals. Naming the animals is much more than just coming up with random sounding words to describe them. Instead, in Hebrew, naming is all, as a thing's name is supposed to represent its nature. Thus, when people have significant encounters with God, frequently their names are changed because they become somebody new at that point. Mm -hmm. Abram becomes Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, Jacob, Israel, and so on. So naming the animals means you've got to understand their nature. That means you've got to study them. And that brings up areas of taxonomy and, frankly, science. So what you have here then, and then you get, of course, Eve as well. So what you have here then is the creation of family, pre-political, arts, sciences, and economy, labor and production and such. All of those things exist, along with rights like liberty and life and such, all of those things exist before politics, before government is established, and therefore all of those things are independent of government. When you take a look at Kuiper's spheres, they align very closely with these pre-political elements of Genesis. Mm 